questions at IIC. We have curated the Maharashtrian cuisine at IIC during the Ganesh Chaturthi festival since 2001. That's about two decades now. Yesterday, we had curated the royal cuisine from the kitchen of the Peshwas. And earlier, we had curated cuisines from the kitchens of the Bonsleys of Nagpur, the Gaikwads of Baroda, the, uh, the Sindhyas of Gwalior, and the Holkars of Indore. We had also curated the street food of Mumbai some years back. Let me begin by introducing Komodi Marathi, chef at large. Komodi is a journalist by training, a chef by choice, and an, in an infinitely curious writer. Born in Pune, she now calls California home. In 2007, she started Ankari, the first organic Indian cooking school and catering company in Los Angeles to shatter the myths that Indian food is curry. A frugal, inventive cook, Komodi begins, combines her native spices and cooking techniques with the ingredients from California, fresh, flavorful, and seasonal foods are the ones she uses. And she tells her students that when they eat real Indian, they won't miss meat. She also works as senior editor for the books team of America's Test Kitchen. Now, uh, Kamiti, can we begin the, the conversation? Yes. So I, I want to ask you a little about your journey from being a journalist in Mumbai to became, becoming a chef at large in California. The opening lines of uh, your book, Share Tables, begin with, I was never going to be a chef. I hope this conversation program will be a virtual feast. As you say in the book, Share Tables, in Marathi, when a meal is being served, you say, Basa. The word literally means sit. But it's an invitation to sit and feast. I hope this conversation with Komodi is a feast for all of us who are participating and watching this program. So I will put the first question to you about, please tell us about this journey from being a journalist to being a chef at large, Komodi. You have to unmute yourself. Is this better? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Okay. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Um, uh, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. And I'm so happy to be here talking to all of you. I'm guessing many of you are Marathi. So I'll say Namaskar. Um, uh, I don't speak Marathi very often. I don't get a chance to, but I like to when I do. And I love it when people say my name right, which Marathi people generally do. So that's lovely. Um, my journey from journalist to chef. I'm still a journalist. I still work as a journalist as an editor. Uh, so I'm doing a lot of writing and I try and write about food. Uh, but I started my career when I studied at S uh, Sophia Polytechnic at the uh, social media uh, course, social communications media course there. And um, I did an internship with the Free Press Journal, which is a historic broadsheet in the city of Bombay. Um, and I had a, an amazing editor, Janathan Thakur, who, um, who was a mentor in a way. So I enjoyed the work I did there, writing about architecture and development. And then I taught at my alma mater. And then I also worked as a freelancer writing about history, local history. Um, so I made friends with Sharda Dvivedi, who also happened to be Marathi. Um, and she was a local historian. Um, and she invited me to write a book. So the first book I wrote had nothing to do with food. It was called Circles of Stone, and it was about the temples of India. So <laughs> I wrote this book. I went into it thinking, oh, this is so great. I love architecture. I'm going to get to travel around the country and, you know, research 
different temple architecture across the country uh, and take my time doing it. I thought I had years to do this project and we were going to get amazing photographs and so on. And my publisher said to me, you have three months. Would you still like to do it? And um, at 26, three months, you say, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> I wanted to publish a book. So yes, I did it. So I spent two months and three weeks doing my research and one week writing 5,000 words a day um, to write the book. So at 53, you think about it a little bit differently, but at 26, you are gung ho. Um, so I did that. And then I pitched a book to her, which I don't think you have with you. And it was this book. Um, Marathi cuisine, a family yeah, it's treasure. Out of print here. It's out of print. It is out of print. Yes, I have my mother-in-law's copy. That's the only <laughs> copy that I have. I said, you're not using it. Could I have it, please? So she gave it to me. Um, but for that book, I pitched the idea of, of talking about the food of my father's family, which is Koknasta, my mother's family, which is Saraswat. And the my publisher said, People don't know about Marathi food, so yes, please do the book. And that was my goal, was to let other Indians know what Marathi food was like, but also to document recipes. And I'm glad I did it then because my grandmother was alive and I was, she was able to share a lot of her recipes with me. And my grand aunt and great aunt was alive, so she shared recipes with me. And then I also got recipes from cousins and aunts and uncles and you know other family members and, of course, my mother. So. Um, this was really mostly about my family, but since I published that book, I found not much had happened uh, about Marathi cuisine in English. And so I pitched a book to Penguin in 2005 and I said, listen, Marathi cuisine is really an important part of Indian cooking traditions. Um, you have an essential cookbook series and you have a Delhi cookbook, you have a Hyderabad cookbook, you have a Goa cookbook. What about Maharashtra? And they said, go for it, do it. So that's how I wrote the Essential Marathi Cookbook. And at this point, the reason I got into cooking more than writing was that there were a lot of misconceptions about Indian food in America, and there still are. Um, my goal was to teach people what real Indian food was like. And so I did that with a lot of the recipes that are in my books, but I also made sure I studied regional recipes from across the country. So I represented different parts of the country. So if you ask me for butter chicken or chicken tikka masala, I will tell you <laughs> about it, but I'll give you the best version there is. Um, but I would love to give you a dish that you've never eaten before. Um, that really represents whether it's Kerala, whether it's Andhra Pradesh or Maharashtra, really represents the cooking of those states or those regions. But that's, In that's fact, hard. just before the program began, I and uh, Hemaji were talking about, you know, if we could, uh, whenever on your next visit to India, we mm -hmm. invite you to, you know, uh, give uh, give us your culinary delights at the India International Center. Because I would love to do that. Yes. So, uh, uh, you know, in the introduction to your uh, book, the essential Marathi cookbook, uh, mm -hmm. you write, I quote, in one more mere generation from that of my father, who was born in 1944 to my own, I was born in 1968. Mm -hmm. Much has been lost of the rich cooking traditions of my native state, Maharashtra. Mm -hmm. It was a very strong statement you made. Now, mm -hmm. why do you say that? Um, well, it started off with, so my father has been one of my biggest resources. Um, he grew up in Pune and he grew up speaking Marathi, which I did not. Uh, so anytime I had a question about language or culture, he was a person I would turn to. Um, he grew up in one house on one street in the city of Pune, and he helped his mother whenever she, whenever she needed uh, ghee, for instance, she said, yeah, I need tup. And so he would run uh, to uh, the old town um, to get her ghee. Uh, so stories like that. So he would tell me a lot of stories about food, the food that he grew up eating and the culture around food that existed. Um, so everything, every social event, and this is before there was social media and before there was TV and before there was video and all of that. So social events like weddings and naming ceremonies and, you know, uh, funerals and things like that all were part of the culture that was that was where you met your family and friends and so on and what you did was eat and mostly you cooked together so you made pickles on the terrace of your house you uh, when somebody came over 
my grandmother would say, for instance, you know, and she would go in and make them, a, you know, a tea. Um, it was all done at home. And so when dad would talk about these things, it was just fantasy for me. I'd never seen that, but I had seen certain things like a pata varvanta, you know, the horizontal ro um, grinding stone. I've seen that. I don't think my daughter's ever seen that, except that I showed it to her once when we came to India, you know, and I don't think people of her generation, 20, 25, know what that is really, because everybody uses a, a Sumit uh, blender to make sakni, um, and so on. So from my father's time, when he had actually a little depression in the floor of his house, where he would, they would make pohe, they would, you know, with using a, a, a stick, pound rice to make pohe. Well, I've seen the depression in that house, but I didn't know that that's what it was used for from that or grind their own wheat. I didn't see that happening, but I've seen those grinders in Kerala, for instance. Uh, from that time to my time where we did have a part of it, to my daughter's time where we don't have any of those things, things were being lost rapidly. And because we live so far away from each other, there's no opportunity, opportunity like I had to watch my grandmother cooking or my other grandmother cooking. My daughter doesn't get that living here. So I wanted to document these recipes before everything was lost in this global right. age. Yeah. So we'll talk about it more now. I'll ask uh, uh, Himaji to come in and uh, ask her questions to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Hema Devri. Think you're on mute. Yeah, it's uh, you have to unmute. Uh, I would like to congratulate you, Kamudi, on putting our Marathi cuisine on the international map. I find that you have taken it to another level. You have not only introduced it to uh, non Marathians but also to the international world, which is a long, long journey. And I think I'm curious to know, what is it about Marathi cuisine that really seems to attract uh, uh, the foreigners or the Americans, or you know, I mean, it's very specific kind of cuisine, and mm -hmm. we have to develop a taste for it. Mm -hmm. But you seem to be doing very well with them. So I'm just curious to know. <laughs> um. The thing that I, when I started my catering company in 2007, by that point, I'd been in this country uh, since 1996. So I had learned because I couldn't work here. So I would write for Indian magazines or newspapers, but I couldn't work because I was on a spouse visa. My husband was studying here initially and then working here. Uh, since I couldn't work, I wrote uh, for, for Indian publications, but I also studied food history. So I read KT Ajay, I read any Indian author who was out there. I read Romanian and Bulgarian, all these other authors mm -hmm. and watched cooking shows, which were very new at the time. And um, people were beginning to be interested in food. Um, and so I, I listened mm -hmm. to how they talked about food. So for instance, um, there's a Gazanachi Koshimbi that I make, my mother's recipe. Um, here, I call it, call it a carrot curry leaf slaw. And so I started to use American jargon to make things understandable, comprehensible to Americans. And because I do that, oh, okay, that's a slaw. Let me try that. Okay, but there's mayonnaise in it. So you can make it for a picnic and take it to a picnic and eat it five hours later. It's still going to be great. In fact, it's going to be better. So I found a way to talk to Americans. And I think that was really important in making our food accessible to them. That said, there's a long way to go because I will still meet people who say, oh, you're Indian. We love curry. And I say, what's that? <laughs> does that answer your question? Yes, yes, it does. I mean, it was a very good job. Yeah, go ahead with the next one, uh, Emaji. Yeah, I find, uh, Komudi, that you have beautifully combined culture and cuisine. I see your book beautifully, you know, combined with it. So, is this how you're presenting your cuisine to your students? and you know to your clients when you are presenting it to them because it's you know i think that makes it more effective if you're going to do that 
Thank you. Um, that's a very good question. So I started Uncurry as a catering company cooking school. So when I'd have people come to my cooking school and I'd be teaching them, I do a class called Spices 101, where I introduce yeah. them to different spices. I show them, I realized that what was different about Indian food in general was that we do a Pordni, a Tarka, a Vagar, which doesn't happen anywhere else in the world. And so I wanted to focus on that. So I would use potatoes, which I don't like to use otherwise because they come from the new world. They come from the Americas. But I would use potatoes in two ways. I would make a simple potato bhaji with mm -hmm. uh, tup, ghee, and put in some cumin seed, have them watch it pop, put in some green chili, and add a boiled potato. And saute that. And boom, the in, in five minutes, and they could taste it. Ooh, it's delicious. It's okay. like browns. We can have this for Sunday brunch. Then I would make potatoes with oil, with mustard, turmeric, and asafoetida or hing. And so I'd make that seasoning. I'd add some red chili powder, and I'd saute that, and I'd have them taste those potatoes. Well, they're still potatoes, but they taste very different. And yeah. that's what I wanted them to understand that spices will will change an ingredient uh, mm -hmm. considerably. So when I was doing the cooking classes, I was cooking along with my students. But mm -hmm. when they asked me for a restaurant recommendation, I would say, come to my house and I'll cook for you. Because there are no restaurants I can recommend, Indian restaurants mm -hmm. in California, I think. New York is a little different. Um, so then I thought, this is interesting. When I'm cooking with my students, um, we're doing something. We're trying to get a meal ready. We're learning. So everything doesn't taste the way I would like it to taste. The students are cooking, and it's their learning and experimentation. So I started doing something called a pop which is uh, I'd have a one-night restaurant. And we'd have wine service, beer service, servers waiting on you, and a certain theme to a meal. So, for instance, I was telling Mr. Borka yesterday, we did a Marusi wedding cake. So, we served it on banana leaf plates. Um, and we made everything pretty much that you had in your uh, Peshwa dinner, you know. Uh, so, she um, um fried little treats, pakoras. Um, we had um, masale bhat. Rice, butter, yeah. all of that, so people could really experience what Indian food was like. So I started doing these pop ups because then I could serve the food the way I wanted to serve it. It wasn't a cooking class. And I also learned to plate food very often in a French style. So it looks beautiful and it's brought to you at your, you know, to, at your table, but it looks like a complete meal and it still has that elegance that French food has which we don't have because we serve everything family style on a thought. Yeah. So I combine those elements to make the mm -hmm. food approachable to Westerners because they eat with their eyes first and their noses and then their mouths. We eat with our hands and our, our mouths. So. That's a beautiful phrase, uh, eating with your eyes. Yeah. 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 So, that's yeah. what our guests also did yesterday when we had this yes. by food. They mm -hmm. were eating with their eyes first <laughs> and noses. Uh, should I ask my next question? Yeah, please, please. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there are some foreigners who are genuinely interested in country India. Let's mm -hmm. say they are India files. Mm -hmm. So your students, are they these India files or you feel even the common Americans do feel interested in uh, your kind of recipes or your kind of cooking? I was curious about that. I think there's a growing interest in Indian food. Okay. Um, just as the, because we are such a global age, so people okay. are interested in Thai food and um, Vietnamese food, Chinese food, of course, has been very popular here. but. There hasn't been an Indian um, yeah. element for them. So, mm -hmm. yes, they're absolutely interested in it. Um, in, uh, I'm on a coast, so the coasts are generally more left wing and, you know, <laughs> um, exposed to things, traveling more and so on. So the middle of the yeah. country is a whole other matter. But I, had, I know somebody yeah. who is from Tunisia, Good who lives in Wisconsin. 
So, you know, in the middle of the country. So there is that interest in different kinds of flavors and spices. And also as the world is changing and more and more people are wanting to turn vegetarian or vegan, I have those students too who want to cook that kind of food, don't want to eat meat, and so they turn to Indian food. They've also heard that our spices are very good for your health. And so they want to look into yeah, yeah. Indian cooking as a means of getting those spices. So I have a mix of people who come to me um, for cooking classes. I also have in Indian Americans, young Indian Americans, whose mother never taught them how to cook. Because they would say, what are you making? And she would say, well, I'm just making something. Let me, let me get on with it. And so the mother never said, hey, this is turmeric. This is um, a cumin. This is mustard. So they never got that, but they like the flavor. And so they would come to me to learn how to cook Indian food. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, one more thing I wanted to find out from you. Like in Punjabi, we have this set menu like palak paneer and tandoori chicken and dal. Then you know that is Punjabi food, which is now famous all over the world. But if you have to present a Marathi menu, you know, like that, can you think of anything which would, you know, like be very signature Marathi food and yet? Uh, can be popularized not only abroad but also in India for yeah. non-Marathi. Can you think of any such uh, menu for us? Uh, I wouldn't want to do just one menu, so I would hesitate. I mean, I think that <laughs> I think that when people think of Indian food, I mean, you're calling it Punjabi. Food. When Americans think of it, they talk about Indian food. So yeah. everything you describe, yeah. you think of as Indian, and that's it. They don't yeah, that's, yeah. They're trying to share that there's other regions and other you know kinds of cuisines in in the country which is huge um yeah. so uh so i wouldn't want to do one menu but i know that desserts are really popular in maharashtra which right. you know, so for instance chikhand may be the most popular yeah. dessert um yeah. but we have so many so put and poli is like you yeah. served the other day guraji poli we have lots of kheers that are very yep. delicious. And the thing is in Maharashtra, very often when you have a dessert, you don't have it every day, but when you have it, it becomes the center of the plate. And it's, you know, yeah. <laughs> that's what you want to eat. Like my grandfather could, he was a little man, but he would eat, he could eat, you know, half a kg of shikhand <laughs> and not touch the vegetables or anything else at all because shikhand was there and that's all he wanted. And when he finished eating, his plate looked clean. Like he, nobody did on it. Um, so I think desserts, I think the fact that we cook our vegetables very lightly is really appealing to listeners. Um, <laughs> things are cooked to a sauce. So you've got the palak paneer. The, paneer, the palak is cooked down to basically, and it's more ground up to the spinach, is um, made into a mash. Whereas in Maharashtra, we tend to saute our vegetables. We do a stir fry. So the fact that we cook our vegetables very lightly, you can still see them, <laughs> they still look like a vegetable, that is really important. Um, we also do a lot of lentils, and I think our lentil recipes are really delicious. So, are you okay? Do you need some water? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, I think. You're right with lentils. That's a typically Maharashtrian way of presenting it, yes. So, yeah, maybe a couple of menus one has to think of, really. Do you do you agree with me, Gomudi, that when, when you think of Marathi cuisine, Maharashtrian cuisine, is generally perceived to be vegetarian. I mean, there are not many non-vegetarian dishes that one talks about in Marathi cuisine. So is there any typical non-vegetarian dish which you would call, uh, you know, a um, signature Marathi dish, which, we, which um, could be popularized? I think it depends on which community you're talking about. So for yeah. instance, the, um, the East Indians, uh, Christians mm -hmm. from Bombay, yeah. they yeah. cook a lot of uh, meat dishes and mm -hmm. uh, they cook with something called bottle masala, which they have ground up for them annually and it's stored in <laughs> beer bottles that I saw. Yeah. Um, every And, you know, they will sprinkle that onto their dishes, but they cook, um, they cook um, pork 
and they cook mm -hmm. chicken and they cook lamb. Um, mm -hmm. There are the Marathas who make a lot of uh, yeah, meat dishes yeah. with, you know, lamb. I like uh, my friend Anuradha Samant, who's from Kolhapur, taught me how to make. I went to her house and watched her cook a uh, Kolhapuri mutton meal with the uh, pandra rasa, you know, the lal rasa, the pulaba, and so on, um, which was amazing to see how meat is used, the same meat is used in, okay. in four different yeah. dishes. So you're getting that flavor, but you're not cooking pounds and pounds of meat. You're making that same <laughs> one pound or two pounds of meat, mm -hmm. but you're putting into four different dishes and you have a coursed meal. You have four different courses. Um, yeah. It was really amazing. Um, and then you've got uh, the Saraswats who eat lots of fish. So mm -hmm. amazing fish dishes. So palm frit yeah. and um, shrimp and so on. Um, uh, very similar to say Goan recipes. Um, so there's a lot there that's really interesting. They're about food as well, you know, like, I don't know what meat dishes if they have any Vidarbha food. Uh -huh. I mean, I love vegetarian dishes, but. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Is that where you're from? No, I'm from Pune. Okay. <laughs> where also we find, you know, very few restaurants which uh, which are serving uh, authentic Marathi cuisine. Right. So it's a real. That's, a, that's a, a peculiar problem. You know, you go to anywhere in Maharashtra, you will not get Marathi yeah. food. You know. Right. You get all exactly. sorts of other things. You get idli dosa. You will get uh, your. Uh, uh, the maki dal and uh, you know exactly. just, uh, <laughs> unfortunately it's yes peculiar, very peculiar. Yes. even in marathi <laughs> weddings we are not getting <laughs> but uh, uh, you remember for both my daughter's <laughs> wedding <laughs> I marathi food. yes because <laughs> that was another thing i was going to mention they, they did it for me at the india international center oh nice, nice. The, the chef uh, you cooked the meal yesterday Kasture, You're he right was now. with the president of India, so he came specially to make both the meals. Uh, that yes. was very special, and I really thanked him. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, now, can I uh, uh, can I pick him now, uh, uh, Himaji? Yes, yes, please. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So I, I, you know, you um, uh, you started this uh, Ankari movement in the U.S. You know, mm -hmm. I think you are the founder of that movement. So can I you was... tell us? I mean, what led you to it, and now this even this. Uh, then we'll come to the Washington Post and your uh, Facebook post and everything. But tell us how it all started and how you have pushed it, you know. I mean, the curry powder is, uh, is yeah. uh, nowhere in your scenario. No, it isn't. It, and it isn't used in real Indian cooking, I yes. don't believe. Um, so <laughs> in 1996, we came to the States to, uh, to uh, Austin, Texas, because my then husband was doing a master's in urban design. So we came there, and as I was tell telling Mr. Devare, I, uh, is it Devare or Devare? Devare. Devare, okay, so it's Devare. Um, that, um, uh, that I had lots of time on my hands to study uh, food history. And so I did, and I studied both Indian and other kinds of food history. And we would have people over because we were used to doing that. So I would entertain a lot, even though I didn't have much cooking equipment or anything. And every time I cooked, the people who came over would say, this doesn't taste like anything Indian we've ever eaten. Is this Indian food? And I would say, yes, but it was very fresh, very brightly colored, you know, beautiful. Just what I was used to seeing my mother cook or my grandmother's cook. Um, and so I, uh, and then if I'd meet a stranger on the street and the stranger would say to me, oh, you're from India, we love curry. And I would say, what is that? So first, as a journalist, I researched this idea of curry and where it came from. And it came from the British. And Mother Jaffrey tells a funny story in one of her books. She says, some Englishman ate something delicious and said, oh, this is delicious. How do you make this? And his Kansama said, um, okay, there's a little entrepreneurial spirit and he put together a masala blend for him and gave it to him. And this is in the 16th century I'm talking about. And um, he said, here, this is how I made it. Now, probably what he ate was could he, and he couldn't say could he. So he did the best he could and he said curry. He said, oh, you made this curry with this powder. Oh, it's a curry powder, okay. And he took it to England and they started making it there. But the mistake they made was they thought that they could put a tablespoon of this powder into veal or lentils or vegetables or whatever they were cooking and it would taste Indian. 
And so they started cooking Indian dishes with curry powder, thinking they were doing the right thing. But they weren't because across India, as you know, we all use different spices. Seasonally, we use different combinations of spices and cook different ingredients. And for potatoes, I might use one kind of spice, but for um, spinach, I might use another. If I want a certain flavor, I'll use coriander and cumin. Um, for a completely different flavor as when we have a fast day, for instance, there's no turmeric used, no mustard seed used. Uh, you'd only use cumin seed and ghee, you know, to get that iron and to get some energy back into the food that you eat. So I started learning about this and I thought, okay, I have to write about it. So I did. Um, and then I thought I need to actually start making this food for people. So when I was able to work, that was 2007, that's yep, when I started sure. Ontario in like a month. Um, because I'd been thinking about this for nine years <laughs> and so I was able to start and I started a series of different classes that I would do. And then when I cooked for people as a caterer, I would make them dishes based on what they wanted. Some of them were traveling to India, so they wanted to eat a nice meal before they went to India. So I said, where, where are you going? If you're going to Bengal and you're going to Andhra Pradesh and you're going somewhere, so I'd find dishes from those regions and make those for them so they get a taste of those flavors um, and so then i started making lots of different regional dishes and i think i mentioned um butter chicken before well i found a recipe for a rajasthani pickled chicken which could have been the source for butter chicken or chicken tikka masala at one point so Yes, I'll make you the butter chicken, but I'll also make you the Rajasthani dish. So you see what the origins are and what the real dish really tastes like. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what I started doing. My so it uh, really took off? Uh, I mean, your, your movement took off and others that people have picked up? No. <laughs> so I wouldn't call it a movement. It's just me fighting the battle. <laughs> oh, um, it's one man army, one woman army. Very one nice. woman army. Um, but there are, for instance, at Test Kitchen, where I work, which is in Boston, I've made, they've understood that they can't keep talking about curry anymore. So mm -hmm. they will talk about curry powder if they're putting that in a dish. Mm -hmm. And then I always say, you can put curry powder in a curry chicken salad that you're making and so on. It's not Indian. Fine, but if you're cooking Indian food, don't talk to me about curry powder. Figure out what spices you need and let's put those in there. So they've understood that and they're beginning to share that with a wider audience. So I'm hoping we can do an Indian cookbook one day soon um, with their reputation. Un curry cookbook, huh? Was call that? it un curry cookbook? No, because it would be America's Test Kitchen exploring Indian food, so it'd be some other title. But I'd okay. use their reputation and my expertise. So I, I just want to read your, you, you know, from your post in the Facebook, this dedicated to the I'm so upset to read the Washington Post piece about foods a certain writer dislikes and see that Indian food is equated with curry powder yet again. I've been trying to explain to Americans for two decades that there is no such thing as curry in India. That's why I started on curry to teach people how to cook real Indian food because my country doesn't Aye. have this one cuisine or Aye. one kind of food with one kind of smell or flavor. It has thousands of years of varied culinary traditions, spices, spice blends, flavorings, and ways of cooking. To run them into a simplistic notion of food, a black thanks thing. to a powder concocted by the British, no self-respecting Indian could cook with, and that doesn't smell Indian at all, is ridiculous and ill-informed to this day and age. For the writer to say he does not like Indian food because he doesn't like the smell of curry powder. Oh boy, he's missing out. He's never tasted the real thing, has he? Hope to cook for him one time. And then the guy apologized, you know, I believe he apologized. I don't think he apologized because of me. He apologized because of Padma Lakshmi and Salman Rushdie, who both okay. tweeted about this. <laughs> and they have a they have a huge following. So obviously their post got some attention and he apologized. But even his apology was not very um okay. not very genuine or uh really explaining or trying to understand um that Indian food is bigger than he thinks it is. So it was just a it was just a you know sort of standard apology that you have to make when you've made, made a big mistake <laughs> and has been published. So, yeah, I don't give that man any credence. And the yeah, Washington okay, Post never got back to me and said, yes, come cook for us. So if they did, I would go there and do it. Yes, right. yeah. now, just tell me about uh, the, the uh, you know, the Gora Masala. Now, do you think that is uh, being overused? 
तो मराठी थोड़ा कुकिंग यू कॉन्ट गेट इट हियर सो वी हैव टू गेट इट फ्रॉम पुणे Yeah, yeah, that is true. Yeah, yeah. and it's, then uh, it's used by a certain community, it's not used by all communities. So, for instance, my friend in Kolhapur would not use goda masala in her cooking at all. Um, and there are other communities that use um, kanda lasun masala or other kinds of uh, spice blends. So there's a lot of difference. Um, my mother's family, which is Saraswat, for instance, doesn't use goda masala at all. But my father's family, which is Kolkata, does. So I think it's very specific to different communities. Okay. Yeah. Okay. No, wait. I'll just. I'll just. Uh, go ahead, Hema ji. You were asking the question. No, I I just want to ask Kamudi. You know, now with your wide experience, um, can you tell us different ways of promoting our Marathi cuisine and Marathi food? Because. <laughs> You, we have been doing it, but you know, I mean, efforts are never enough. We really would like to know how should one go about it. And do you would you? I'll add add on. Do you think uh, uh, as uh, Maharashtrians, I'm getting a little regional, but we lack the entrepreneurial spirit. You know, do you think so? <laughs> True. Agreed, Suhas. <laughs> yeah, but we'll ask uh, Kamal to answer that. Yeah. Uh, no, I agree that I mean that's what I've always been told by elders in the community that uh, we're not business people. We're not, you know, the kind of people who go set up a restaurant like a like a um, Udupi joint or a um, Punjabi restaurant. Um, so that's why. And then, for instance, most people ate food at home, not eating out. Yeah. until recently so for instance my grandfather had never eaten in a restaurant he'd never drunk tea or coffee so he wouldn't know about eating in a restaurant i mean his children weren't allowed to eat out anywhere like eat at another friend's house for instance no they had to come home and eat and i think part of that was to make sure that your kids stayed healthy but partly it was you wanted to make sure they didn't eat what they weren't supposed to because of certain food restrictions you know they ate no onion no garlic <laughs> no meat obviously um and so um people lived like that so you didn't go to restaurants until i mean the first time i went to a restaurant with an uncle was when we had lived in canada and we came back and my father's brother took us to vaishali in pune and yeah. i felt this was so unusual because people when i had left india in 1977 were used to going out to restaurants <laughs> per se in pune um so i think that's part of it and therefore you know we don't have restaurants and then also bombay street food which is served in restaurants like pav bhaji misor pav and so on that is a certain kind of food and that you'll get but again yeah, that's been doctored to to uh, please the palates of people who want something spicy who want something you know in a certain way rather than uh say the kind of food i like to eat so i think that uh, there needs to be well i hope that with more books being published uh people will start cooking the food more but i think maybe if a restaurant opened in bombay that served the food actually really served the food then in an, in a beautiful way and made it a book for people and jewish restaurants, restaurants and so on and maybe we could get more publicity in the only way you know Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Hemaji, go ahead with your. Please, all. Start it. Don't don't do it. Start it. Hemaji. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Komudi, I must say, I was very touched when I read in your book that 
um, as a last wish of a, an American lady, I think as a dying wish, you cook yes. Marathi food for her. Yeah, that was really very very touching. That means it meant so much to her. Your cooking. Um, she her. had never eaten my food before. Actually, uh, oh, her boy, her boyfriend, her partner called me. She oh. had um, um, ALS. Uh, mm -hmm. So Lou Gehrig's disease, so annual uh, lateral uh, sclerosis. So it affects the brain, and it starts from the extremities. Usually, um, affects your feet, affects your hands, and then ultimately your vocal cords. So she couldn't speak, and then you're not going to be able to chew. And then finally, usually the life of a person with ALS is one to three years. So she was in a bed, and she used to use a computer to talk. And this was her birthday dinner, and was going to be the last meal she was going to be able to chew. Uh, so I, I didn't cook just Marathi food for her. I cooked some of her favorite dishes from Indian restaurants and so on. I made a raita that she wanted and things like that. But the entire meal was Indian, um, a real Indian, and she enjoyed it. Um, and yeah, <laughs> it was literally the last full meal she ate, and then she died a few months later. So um, I was happy to be able to do that for her. I know. And my cousin was dying at the same time of the same disease. Um, oh. At the age of 45, so it was very poignant, very um, special to cook that meal. So maybe you should come on a tour to India. Comedy, I want to. And, uh, and, you know, and then popularize our food, you know, in different. <laughs> Delhi definitely needs your presence here. Thank you. And you know, I've never been to Delhi, so I would love to come. Yeah. Oh, you've never been to Delhi, is it? Oh, Delhi, no. Delhi, uh, uh, no. We would like to host you at the IIC then. Oh, thank you. I would love to come one day. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Now, uh, uh, tell us how how do you foresee, say, ten years down the line, uh, how how do you see Marathi food uh, in the US? Um. <laughs> uh, well, I'm not doing my pop-ups anymore, so that's a problem. But I'm hoping somebody else will pick up the mantle and 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 you know uh, do that. Um, I think that there's more um, awareness of regional foods now in India, and there's also an awareness that we need to represent them. So, for instance, in the book publishing world, um, when I wanted to write the Essential Marathi Cookbook, I wanted to write that actually for an American publisher in 2008. I, my agent offered to shop it around to American publishers. And the answer that, that she would get was, we love her idea, but we already have one Indian author on our list. Um, and I was thinking, well, you've got five Italian authors, so why just one Indian? You know, but that's the way the world was in 2008. I think in 2021, it's different. So, for instance, Priya Krishna's book came out called Indianish, and it really is just the food that her mother cooked for her when she was growing up here as an Indian American. Um, but people love it because she makes food easy for people to understand. There's nothing Marathi there, but the South Indian food and so on. Um, but I think that with more and more Indian authors being published here um, yeah. and the food being made easy. What people don't understand about Indian food, oh, they th think they can't tackle it, that it's not going to be easy. And what I show them in my cooking classes is you can have an Indian meal ready in under an hour. You can make a dal, you can make rice, you can make a bhaji, and you can make a raita, koshimbir. Uh, all these four things you can have ready. All you need is organization and planning. So you get your dal going, you get your rice going, and we're not using a pressure cooker here because food cooks much quicker here. The ingredients are slightly different. So you get that going, and then while that's cooking, you make your bhaji, and then you make your rata, and you're ready to eat. So I was thinking that'd be a great cooking show. <laughs> and then um, a woman named Rachel Ray came out on the Food Network with a show called 30 Minute Meals. <laughs> so I thought, if you're doing it in 30 minutes, then maybe you don't want a meal that takes an hour to cook. But I think there's more awareness now, and I think that in 10 years, you will see more and more people cooking different kinds of Indian food. Uh, much more than they do now. So has uh, the entry of Kamala Harris done something? Ah, exactly, I was going to say that. <laughs> yeah, um, it has in certain circles, um, but she doesn't. She doesn't show off her Indianness very much. So, uh, but yes, definitely, I know that where her mother came from. in a kitchen or something, entering a kitchen and uh, you know uh, uh, doing something. There was some show I saw. Mm -hmm. I can't exactly remember. Yeah. But uh, 
yeah there's something like that uh, some yeah. uh, you know uh, food uh, food from uh, uh, Tamil Nadu or something mm -hmm. like that. That's right. Yeah. No, it all makes a difference. And for instance, we've got Sanjay Gupta. We've got other people who are in yeah. the public eye who are Indian or Indian American. Um, so I definitely think it's going to be different. And I think there's going to be more cookbooks published of regional Indian food um, and recipes. So uh, I, yeah, I think that'll be there in 10 years from now. And uh, what do you, uh, how is, uh, you know, the, the sweet dishes from Maharashtra? Are they available in the stores easily? Like Srikhand is sold or you don't uh, get Amul Srikhand there or something? I don't think you get Amul. You get a Gujarati Srikhand because the entrepreneur is a Gujarati. So that is uh, Srikhand. I find it always sweet. Um, whereas I like my Srikhand sort of sweet tart. <laughs> You know, have that nuance of flavor. So, uh, store bought shikhan doesn't do it for me. But no, you don't find Marathi sweets represented at all, unless it's something that's also made in North India. So, mango budfi, for instance, you were mentioning yesterday that you got from Chitarish. Um, You'll find that kind of budfi maybe, but you'll find all kinds of budfi in an Indian store, but not necessarily a Marathi dish. You won't find shankarpari. You will find Punjabi shakarpara or savory. Uh, you know, Shankar Pari, but you won't find the Marathi ones that say my mother makes. Um, and so it's going to take a while. <laughs> and the thing is, I'm not doing this anymore. So it's not like I, I can help except through writing. Um, so why, why did you give it up? I mean, is there something I more? Give, I didn't give it up. I still teach private classes, but um, I work for Test Kitchen now. So that's a full time job. Um, so, uh, I can only do private classes on weekends. I still do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. But there are no Marathi stores serving puran polis and things like that, is it? No. Not I was the only one doing that. Oh, that's mm -hmm. unfortunate because we have such a large Maharashtrian community as well now, isn't it? In the yeah, I think there is actually a, what's it called? What is the Marathi organization called? Uh, Maharashtra Mangal. Maharashtra Mandar, yeah. Well, they actually called yeah, me a few yeah, years yeah. ago and yeah. asked me to cater one of their um, okay. events for them. Uh, and they wanted Puran Poli and, and so on. And unfortunately, the dates conflicted and I couldn't do it. Oh, but okay. And they were having a big event. It was, you know, 200, 400 people. Yeah, 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 but yeah, I, yeah. again, I would have been cooking for Marathi people. Okay. Uh, so in the Maharashtra Mandar, that's who was going to be there. Um, okay. Yeah. But so uh, during, the, the, during the Ganesh Chaturthi, I mean, is there some kind of a, uh, no, there's no, 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 there's no awareness. I put out a picture of a, a stone Ganapati that, that I have on my Instagram, but um, most people don't, I mean, they say happy Ganesh Chaturthi, but there's no talk of Marathi food. No. Maybe in your area, there are not that many. There's no, yeah, there aren't many Indians here, but so where the, you know, for instance, where the Maharashtra Mandal is, yes, they will be doing something, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, but again, that's the Marathi community, so it's not going out to other people. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. That's what we would like them to do, you know, out right. and spreading awareness right. of Marathi cuisine. That, right. That's right. I mean, what you are doing, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, tell us about... Uh, you know the the Indian restaurants there. I mean, how are they doing? Or is it? Uh, I mean, do the cooks still come from Silet more from Silet in Bangladesh, or what's the scene like? Um, uh, I wouldn't be able to tell you about who the cooks were, but for instance, there's a a store here that I go to to buy my Indian, you know, ingredients and so on. He, the man is from the Punjab. He has a lot of cooks in the back making food, and he does things like alu paratha <laughs> and so on. And he serves the standard buffet uh, meal. So yes, people will go to it because it's cheap and it's quick, it's ready. And so when they want a quick fix, they will go there, but they won't go to an Indian restaurant um, really. They do in New York, it's different in New York, but in LA, they won't go to an Indian restaurant for a fancy meal. Um, it's not set up like that. Nobody is cooking that kind of food, except maybe one restaurant in Beverly Hills. Um, so that's what I was trying to do with it. Give Marathi food or give Indian food sort of that stature that French food has here. So when you go to a French restaurant, for instance, you pay a lot of money for food. That's very good, uh, but it's served a certain way, French or even Italian, some Italian restaurants 
food is served a certain way, it looks beautiful and so on. I wanted to do that with Indian food. So if you look on my website, for instance, you'll see pictures of how I plated the food and I plated it, as I said, in a very French way, uh, so that it was appealing to the eye. And um, nobody else is doing that, um, at least on the West Coast. So if they start doing that and plating it the way that people here recognize and understand, it might get more, um, more so it's, it's like uh, the way to the, to the stomach is through the eyes. The eyes <laughs> here in the West, it is definitely. Yeah, it has to appeal. No, here okay. also we are developing boutique restaurants now. You know, we're catering to very high end. Uh, yeah, but it's right. uh, it's not come down to uh, appealing uh, at the you know the middle and the lower levels. That is true. Right. right. Yes, it's the more like is... filling the stomach. You know, then. Yeah. Uh, that's the great thing about Indian restaurants, though. You can go in, get a quick bite, whether it's an idli dosa or, you know, um, marki juice or whatever it is. You get that and you go away happy, satisfied, and you're not really doing it to linger over your food. And that's a different what experience. I, what I found very interesting was that, uh, you know, I think it was uh, in New Jersey mm -hmm. that I uh, they, they would weigh the food and give uh, you could buy by weight. I found that very odd, you know. Oh, it is? Wait, very odd, but it also there's a precedent for that. In Texas, you can buy barbecued meats by weight. Oh. You go to a restaurant. No, this was vegetarian. I mean, yeah, this was, uh, but I'm uh, saying you know, that rice and uh, curry and, well, I mean, I'm using the word curry. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. yeah. All that, uh, but, but yeah. Uh, you know, matar paneer and all that, yeah. but by weight. By weight. Now, yeah. is that a common thing or? No, it's not a common thing, um, but I'm saying it is done. And for instance, in some kind of American restaurants where you just would, it's easier to sell by weight. Oh, okay. You bought a pound of this. All right, fine. I'll charge you for a pound. This is the price per pound. And I think in New Jersey, New Jersey is basically little India. So <laughs> when you are there, you don't feel like you're in America at all in certain parts of New Jersey. Um, so there, I think there's so many people, even Indians coming to get food, that it's easier to just sell it by weight quicker than, you know, having yeah, this, was, this was actually just two minutes uh, from the Hudson River. So it was very mm -hmm. close to New York, but it mm -hmm. was the same, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. by weight. I, I was amazed by this. I'd never seen this concept. Mm -hmm. uh, was, it good food food? By weight. was it good food? No, it was uh, very ordinary. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry. But there are so many high-fi Indian restaurants and people don't go there because they find it too expensive. Isn't that the case? Uh, there must Indian be so many. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because uh, there must Indian. be so many at the West Coast as well, isn't it? Not many, no. Many, is it? Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I can name maybe two. In Los okay. Angeles, I can name two. Okay. San Francisco, again, there's a lot of Indians because of the tech community. Um, and again, it's like what Suhas was describing, you know, the restaurants where you go, you go get an Udipi meal or yeah. just something quick. And there's a lot of right. South Indian techies there. Okay. So wow. they want something that will feed their stomach and their bachelors, maybe they don't cook and so on. Mm -hmm. So you get that kind of food um, or you get there's a place called Vix, which is fast food. It's Punjabi again, but you get all sorts of fast food there oh, and you pick up the food at different stalls and then you go sit down and eat. Um, so there's there's that, which is great. That appeals to people. but people have a certain notion of what Indian food is yeah, because yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and we want to change that. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I would like to ask you one uh, uh, question, you know, um, mm -hmm. uh, don't, I hope you don't find it intimidating. The, mm -hmm. the question is, uh, you've not thought of doing a TV show with the, uh, with the, your, uh, as a host on television? Um, I didn't think of it much. I was asked to do it. Um, I think I was too uh, shy of the camera at that point. Uh, I'm not shy of the camera anymore. <laughs> so I think that my um, my creative director at America's Test Kitchen and I are talking about something. So maybe you'll see something in the near future. Oh, that would be good. Yes, that's what I was thinking. I mean, it's high time you did that, you know, and yeah. we would watch your show. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And it's available <laughs> on YouTube and, you know, so on. So you should be able to watch it. No, but I, what I meant was, uh, you know, the, on the uh, on the main channels, if you, mm -hmm. you would come on that, that would mm -hmm. make a big difference, you know. I mean, it you would. could be, yeah, you could be a a celebrity chef on the main channel. <laughs> Being a celebrity has never been important to me. Um, I would just like to share something about the richness of my no, country's food. No, but that is the you may not like to look that way, but others may look at you. 
So that's okay. It doesn't yes, stop. I can't do anything about that. <laughs> yeah. But I think I have a viewpoint. I think I have a certain way of looking at food, whether it's Marathi or any other Indian food, and I want to correct the record <laughs> about curry. So uh, what, what, uh, what Hemaji I, said, you know, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I've uh, been deeply touched by that. How you integrate uh, culture, you know, with mm -hmm. the food. Mm -hmm. That that's uh, that's uh, you know very important. And there's a you have developed a historicity to the mm -hmm. food. You think. Yeah, that's unique. I think. I I, I yeah. think it's really important to do that because if you forget your roots, then you don't quite know where you're going. Um, so I think history is important. Uh, for me, it was especially important because I didn't really grow up in Maharashtra. So for me, it was a way to learn about my my state, my culture, my history, um, even my family history. So food was a really delicious way to do that. Um, and uh, so that was important to me. But I think food is also story for me. So uh, as as my grandmother would be cooking, I'd be asking her questions about cooking in Indore or learning how to cook. Whom did you learn from? And so on. And those moments are lost now because we're not with our grandmothers or our aunts or, you know, so on. And so kids don't always have that opportunity to learn history sort of um, organically as as they're living their childhood. It's more. We have coined an acronym, you know, it's called uh, NRM. Non-resident Maharashtrian. Oh, okay. I see. So <laughs> I, I am one. So okay. Yes. I've been and brought up in Delhi, but I'm very keen on pushing this. You know, this yeah. uh, Maharashtra cuisine. And Himaji has been a uh, great uh, help to I all of us. Very, very, very proud Maharashtrian. I can vouch for that. <laughs> Even if you are non-resident. <laughs> no, but it's very important. You know, we some tend to forget our roots. You see, that's uh, it's uh, and you. Uh, I mean. You are, uh, you know, as they say, uh, away seven oceans, but you are doing it so well there. So we are proud of you. Oh, you know? thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so um, on that note uh, of uh, uh, pride on Kamodi's, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, the effervescence and the and the, the way she is going about propagating uh, Maharashtrian food, Marathi culture. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. And uh, what time is it now? It's about touching uh, seven thirty now at your end. Yeah, almost seven thirty. Yeah. yeah. So thank you very much. We woke you up so early today. Oh, that's thank okay. Thank you very much for joining us. Of course, my thank pleasure. You. And uh, happy Ganesh Chaturthi to you. Happy yeah. Ganesh Chaturthi. And we look forward to seeing you in India very soon. Thank Enjoy you. I'll let you know when I'm coming. <laughs> okay. Yes. okay. And we'll arrange a special. Uh, you know, uh, 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 I mean, you could. Uh, Create a, a dinner or whatever you feel for us here. Thank you oh, very much. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Take okay. care. Bye bye. Bye. bye.